All right, everybody. Um, good, good afternoon. Thank you so much for uh, joining us this afternoon for uh, a very special uh, and rare event. Uh, we have with us today uh, Dr. Munsif uh, Sheikh Ruhu, who is a member of the Tunisian Constituent Assembly representing the second district of Tunis. He is one of 17 members of the assembly from the Progressive Democratic Party and is one of the uh, leading luminaries of that party. Um, when uh, uh, Dr. Munsif is not engaged in the great and real task of building Tunisian democracy, he is a gifted and quite accomplished scholar who currently uh, serves as a professor of managerial economics and international finance at the HEC School of Management in Paris. Um, he was educated here in the United States where he got his MBA and PhD at the University of California in Berkeley and prior to that he was trained in mechanical engineering in Paris. Um, Dr. Munsef is a great institution builder as you would want from somebody who is tasked with building uh, Tunisian democracy. Uh, and he has founded several uh, investment and commercial banks and was the largest shareholder of a privately owned uh, Sabah Press Group, which was established uh, by his father, uh, Habib Sheikh Ruhru, who is a legendary figure in uh, Tunisia's independence struggle. So there is a continuation of the legacy of members of this family contributing in great and real ways to uh, Tunisian progress. Um, he has also founded the Development Finance Institute, which was aimed at uh, training graduate students uh, hired to be hired by banks and in the ministries of finance in the Middle East and North Africa. And he's a member of several uh, boards and associations. People often, uh, when they compare uh, the country that um, Dr. Mosef is from Tunisia to the one that I am from, Egypt, people are often very optimistic about Tunisia and very pessimistic about Egypt. And my suspicion is that the reason for this divergence is that Egypt does not have nearly as many people of uh, Dr. Munsif's uh, uh, character. So um, today he will speak about the Arab Spring. And uh, before uh, he does that, I want to thank many of the uh, people who, were, uh, who helped make this uh, extraordinary event possible. So that includes the Middle East Initiative of the uh, Kennedy School of Government, the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation, the Program on Moroccan Studies at the Center for Middle East Studies, the Crown Center for Middle East Studies at uh, Brandeis University, and a very extraordinary young Kennedy School uh, student who is not here with us now, but uh, will be here later, Duncan Pickard, who uh, was instrumental in making this happen. So without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Molson. Well, thank you very much for all the exaggerations you have uh, put in, in uh, presenting me. Uh, I'm very, very glad and very proud and very honored to be with you today here. And I thank you to have created this opportunity to share with you um, my, la my latest and uh, my colleagues' latest experience in uh, uh, this democratic transition in Tunisia. Uh, my colleagues in the Parliament of Tunisia, we are 217 now, are aware of uh, my visit here to you. They convey their salute to you and they think that sharing this experience, sharing your questions, your insight is very dear to us. What's happening in Tunisia is not only Tunisia, but I think, it, I think it's the whole world. Is it uh, a sudden uh, revolution that took place in Tunisia, in Egypt, uh, in Libya? Was it predictable? Uh, the French president said, we, nous n'avons rien vu venir. We didn't see it come. Uh, I don't agree with him. I start this presentation by a picture uh, that uh, was taken in 1938. On the far left of this picture, there is a... No, it's the other way around. On the far left, there is this gentleman here, Farhat Hachet, who used to be the labor union leader in Tunisia. He got shot some years later by the Main Rouge, the terrorist organization that was serving the colonial power in Tunisia, the equivalent of OAS in Algiers later. Here is the head of the Chambers of Commerce of Sfax, the second largest city in Tunisia. And these are businessmen of Sfax. So uh, bosses, labor unions, we're asking for what? 
they were asking for Tunisian parliament. And in Arabic it was written, La Buddha min Parlament Tunisi, 1938. In uh, at the extreme left of this picture, the young man, 24 years old, that's my father. He was, gave me that picture and he told me, you carry that picture and if you see a Tunisian parliament when you're alive, you, uh, uh, you uh, read the Fatiha for me. If you don't see it, you give the picture to your children and ask them to read the Fatiha for us. He didn't know that 73 years after this picture, his son was going to be elected in this parliament. So this comes back to very, very, very long, not only in Tunisia, but the people in the Middle East wanted to be treated as citizens and not as subjects. And this is why I think personally, and the people think, that they deserve this democratic transition. Is it, uh, sorry, yes, no, I, I would like to say, to have the other slide, thank you very much, yeah, this one. Is it a, is it a manageable transition? I think it's this one. No, the right, right, right. that's it. Is it a manageable transition? At the eve of the election, uh, in Tunisia, we had more than 100 parties that were running for election. Actually, some of them withdrew uh, right before the election. We had 79 parties that ran for election. But how can you govern a country with 72, 79 parties? We got really dizzy. But we received the visit of the uh, first prime minister of Spain after the fall of uh, Franco. And he told, me, told us not to be nervous about that because in Spain they had even more parties uh, during the first election. And after the election they started to regroup in two, three, four, five main parties. So we expect the regroupings to be taking place. The party I have uh, presented myself with is called PDP, the uh, Parti Democrat Progressiste, Progressive Democratic Party. Uh, the tendencies of regroupments will be around the Islamic parties that you see here. In Nahda is the largest winner of this election and it has uh, more moderate Islamic parties around it. Uh, and some non-Islamic parties who elected to join the uh, Nahda in the Troika that is governing uh, the country now. There is the liberals which are here for free market in blue, the hard liberals and the less hard liberals. There is the nationalists, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, pro-Syrian, pro-Iraqi parties for Wahda Arabiya. And there are the socialists and communists here. We expect to have two main central parties, central left and central right. Now, the Anada itself is not expected to remain as it is because in itself there are tendencies that are pro-left and tendency, uh, tendencies that are pro-liberal economics. Uh, for the time being, the regroupments are taking place and we think that the panorama of uh, the parties in Tunisia will lead to manageable set of parties in the parliament. What does the parliament do? Can we move to the Thank you. No, to the PowerPoint presentation. The uh, assembly is called National Constituent Assembly. That means it has two jobs. We are supposed to write the constitution, so it is constituent. But we are a parliament, we have to vote laws. We are what is called in Arabic, musharri'in. And I'll come on this word, it's important to say it in Arabic. So, uh, the constitution of Tunisia has been written in 1956 in six months. But former President Bourguiba started changing it in order to tailor, to tailor it for his own interest. He has eliminated all the oppositions and had a constitution that made him practically the dictator of the country during the 30 years he ran the country. And he passed on the country to another dictator, Mr. Ben Ali, so for 50 years the country had a constitution that was regularly, uh, uh, completely forced and raped, unfortunately. In uh, this presentation, I wish to show why 
the young Tunisian people have, uh, uh, have gone through the danger of doing this revolution. So the first part of our job is to write a constitution that corresponds to the desires of the Tunisian women and men. The second job is to vote laws, mainly the budget of the country, the uh, uh, laws on uh, the uh, commerce and on making the country an emerging economy. I have been elected, in spite of my being in the opposition, as a vice president of the finance committee. We are in charge of finance, of economic strategy of the country, and of regional development. Regional, regional development is important because there are some rich areas of the country on, on the coast and very, very poor areas that did not benefit from investments in infrastructure for more than 15 years, and those were the areas where the revolution has started. Mohammed Bouazizi burnt himself in one of those areas. So therefore, addressing the reconstruction of these areas and putting infrastructure there is paramount today. So this is the setup of the work of the 217 representatives of the Tunisian people. Uh, you're going to tell me, but how can you speak so openly when you are not in government? True. I am part of the legislative branch, but the executive branch is Anada with two other parties called Atakatul and CPR. Three of them have a majority in parliament. But when it comes to decision making, we notice that Anada, which has no experience, always seeks consensus with other and mainly with the opposition. Let me give you an example. When they presented a project of a, a temporary constitution saying that the prime minister ought to hire and fire the governor of central bank, I took the uh, uh, floor and I said this would be dangerous. We shouldn't do that. And actually the rating of Tunisia would become even worse. And explained why. So they neither came to me and said, okay, let's write it the way you think. And we wrote the following the president or the prime minister will propose a governor for the central bank but the parliament the national assembly will approve or disapprove the president or the prime minister will propose the firing of the governor if he makes a, a mistake and the parliament will approve or disapprove and <coughs> even if the president and the prime minister are happy with the governor but he is not good for the country because he's pleasing the wife of the president, for instance, by sending $500 million for her uh, buying Fifth Avenue clothes, then the president will not complain, and he will stay there forever. Then our commission in the parliament has the authority to enact a proposal to the general uh, meeting to remove the governor of Central Bank. And that way we had all the cases treated and Inada has voted this law this way. So that means that they have no experience, they have ideological views, but they don't have practical views. We have been advancing quite well on the uh, elaboration of the Constitution. Uh, in the Constitution we have two types of laws. We have laws that are called fundamental laws. They are pillars on which the Constitution will stand. We have already reached agreement on some pillars with another. First pillar is the women's right. The Code du Statut Personnel uh, is the law that Bourguiba has proposed 50 years ago to give all the rights to Tunisian ladies, equal rights with men, uh, is going to be a fundamental law. Actually, we noticed that that law had a loophole. Ladies don't laugh. It had a loophole because a loophole because, as you know, in Tunisia, it is illegal for a man to have more than one wife. So Bourguiba has uh, had written that very clearly in the law. But what we noticed a couple of years ago is that some Tunisian ladies have two husbands, and when the judge was asking them, why are you breaking the law? They told him, 
which article of the law are we breaking? And in the law, it was written that a man could not have more than one wife, but it was not said that a wife could not have more than one man. So, you see, uh, something had to be corrected somewhere there. Fine. So, this is the first pillar. We have agreed on it. Second pillar we have agreed on, with another, is that fundamental liberties will become a fundamental law. That means the liberty to believe in whatever you feel, to believe in uh, God or not to believe in God, to believe in a specific religion, uh, you have the freedom to do whatever you want, except that you should not bother your neighbors. You don't force your neighbors to follow your uh, uh, way of behavior. And this, in Narda, uh, has approved on it, has approved it. Now we have two hurdles in front of us. The first hurdle is that we have to decide, should we propose a parliamentary system where the executive branch will be led by the prime minister who has the majority in parliament, or should we have a presidential system like we used to have before in Egypt, Mr. Mubarak was the head of the executive. Uh, in Tunisia, Ben Ali was the head of the executive. Now, there is a divergence in Tunisia on this. They look at Italy, they look at Germany, it is a parliamentary system, it works very, very nicely. They look at the United States, they think it is a presidential system, but the parliament sometimes makes life very, very hard to the president. Remember this summer when they were not allowing money to be spent beyond the given ceiling of debt. So, presidential system should be used very carefully. So they were taking the, the example of France, where there is a presidential system. The president rules. He nominates the prime minister, but the president now in France has a majority in parliament. This is dangerous too, because there is no counter effect. There is no opposition that can play a significant role. And this is why the French economist uh, Serge Christophe Colm has written, in France, we elect very democratically a dictator for five years. Because once, because once you elect him, you cannot do anything about his mistakes. So Tunisia has paid a high price having dictators. Uh, the Nahda is major, majoritarily in favor of the parliamentary system. The PDP and other and secular parties, Communist Party, are majoritarily in favor of the presidential system for the bad reasons, because they are led by leaders who resisted dictatorship. They are very strong people, and now they have reached an age where they think they should become presidents. So this is a bad moment that we have to negotiate and select the system that fits Tunisia the best. The second hurdle that we have is that some, not in Nahda, but some Salafists who are not in parliament because they don't have the right to start a party if they don't recognize the constitution of Tunisia. Some Salafists who are not jihadists, but theoretical Salafists, say Tunisia does not exist. The country, we don't recognize it. We belong to the Ummah. The flag does not exist. Uh, we don't recognize any law, there is no parliament, etc. So these people demonstrate every day in Tunis, they take down the Tunisian flag. Once they took it down, and a young lady, 23 year old, climbed the building and went up on top of the building and she put the Tunisian flag again. The Tunisian president gave her a decoration. But the civil society is reacting all the time. Salafists want the constitution to put very clearly that the source of the law will be the Sharia. And here we have a debate. We tell them, Sharia, what is it? If Sharia is the laws that have been accumulated for 14 centuries by human beings, then we are making the Sharia. We are the <laughs> Musharra. And Tarek Ramadan came to Tunis and gave speeches saying in London, the Sharia is whatever is voted by the British Parliament. So this is the direction that even in Nahda is following. We will take only the first article of the Constitution of Bourguiba, which says in Arabic, 
تونس جمهورية مستقلة الإسلام دينها والعربية والعربية لغتها تونسيا is an independent republic Islam is its religion and Arabic is its language and we no longer come back and quote anything on Islam it has a reference that's not religious according to our understanding it is an identity and it is cultural rather than religious so therefore we hope to reach a constitution that respects the identity of Tunisians and I must say that all the parties and mainly my party uh, respects very very much Islam uh, actually all of us are Muslims and devout and pra we practice Islam but we, want, we don't want to mix Islam with dirty politics we want it to be higher so therefore uh, these are the main hurdles that are facing us we need to finish by October because we are a temporary assembly uh, the government is temporary and the president is temporary we need to have elections by the end of the year they announced maybe March 2013 as the latest date for elections to have a new parliament a new government and a new president for five years so this is where we are at so you're gonna tell me everything is beautiful it's working well we look like a boat that has lived that has left a bank of a river a very dangerous river with lots of currents and it wishes to go to the other bank the bank of democracy respect of the citizen and growth but in the middle of the river there are very tumultuous currents and you ask the Tunisians what is the situation today looking like and they tell you oh my god it's awful but you tell them do you want us to come back to where we were a year and a half and they say no we don't want dictatorship anymore so we are in the middle of this road we have to keep on crossing and we have to reach the other side so where does it hurt politically discussions are there we are discovering that we are maybe competitors but we are not enemies we are all of us Tunisians we are not enemies one interesting feature is that Tunisia has insisted on having as many ladies in the assembly as possible one way to achieve it was a novelty uh, they decided that each list that runs for the uh, uh, elections have has to alternate to alternate man woman man woman or woman man woman man but no two successive men or no two successive women why because since it is a um, uh, success by proportional uh, vote you take the first elected then the second then the third so the more people are elected on the list the more the parity is respected in parliament today 27 percent of the parliament are ladies most of them are with another for a mechanical reason because Inada has won most of the lists so it's the lists where you go down the, to the lowest and you have many another ladies and many another men who have succeeded uh, but it's good to do these attempts because you see that the Tunisian woman the Tunisian mother has been playing a very important role in this revolution for many decades the Tunisian mother used to ask two questions my mother asked me two questions when I was in Berkeley did you study well and did you eat well okay so you recognize the Mediterranean mother or the Jewish mother or the Tunisian mother but the did you study well is very important mothers sold their jewelry in order to pay for the studies of their kids so this is an investment and thank you for reminding it because Tunisia has mm, some oil but not too much some phosphate and the only resource was human beings it worked so well until 10 years ago and 10 years ago the quality of education per dinar spent which was growing all the time started to decrease as under Mr. Ben Ali the quality of education started to hurt the quality of diplomas which affected the quality of jobs and the quantity of jobs and here the degree holders could not 
keep on living without jobs. So let me share with you this uh, presentation on what is called the Arab Spring. According to me, our country is beyond extracting and exporting resources, oil or phosphate or whatever, beyond successful traditional subcontracting. Europeans invest in our countries uh, or Americans or Chinese and we manufacture for them and we sell. This, these two activities are not sufficient. The, the name of the game today is emergence. We are saying that a region from Egypt to uh, Morocco that was growing at around 5% a year has a potential of between 8 and 10% growth. 3% will be coming from the bad governance that will be corrected, according to the World Bank. We are missing each and every year 3% growth that's preventing us from reaching the 8%. Why is 8% important? Because if we don't reach 65 to 7% growth, kids are going to stay without a job. Newcomers on the job market will have we stand a better chance to find a job when we grow at 8% or 7%. So below that rate, we're condemning some guys to take a boat, a makeshift boat, to go illegally to Europe, and many of them die in the Mediterranean. That's killing young people. The em emergence is there. The second source of emerging, emergence is the trade between Country, neighboring countries, horizontal trade. If you look at trade between Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, and Egypt, it's the lowest level of trade between any neighbors in the whole world. Even the Gulf Cooperation Council that create oil and gas, they exchange more than North Africa from Morocco to Egypt. So we are prevented from getting the advantage that the Nobel Prize uh, uh, in America showed as the economies of scale. What's his name? Uh, Krugman. Krugman. Krugman showed something that is weird. Ricardo was not very true when he thought that developed countries are going to sell machines to uh, underdeveloped countries that are going to sell sun or tourism or whatever. He noticed that the exchange between developed countries is much higher than exchange between developed and underdeveloped. The reason for that is economies of scale. So in the southern Mediterranean, we need to have that economies of scale, those economies of scale through opening up. So the real and sustainable path is human capital development. This is the bet in all the Arab Revolution countries. Bet on human capital. And w there is no mistake, the younger generation that is now in my party is called JDP, the Young Democrat Progressives, they are much more uh, active on the field, going to visit poor people, going to visit unemployed, going to try and find jobs, r than us who are sitting in universities making lectures. So they are telling us, this country is ours. And this sense of appropriation is very strong. The revolution took place because of one word, dignity. But what is dignity for these people who are facing sometimes uh, cartridges or burning themselves like Mohammed Bouazizi? Dignity is firstly human. We want to be represented in a parliament. And there is a key word because one man, one vote, one time, we know that. But one man or one woman and one vote with what is in French called alternance. That means peaceful, uh, how do you say that? Succession on power, peaceful rotation of power. This is the next test to all the countries with the Arab Revolution. We have to be successful in convincing Ennahda in Tunis in convincing whatever majority you're going to have uh, when Muslimin in Egypt, in convincing those governments that after they come to power, if they flunk it, then they have to accept that some other majority will come. In the meantime, they will prepare themselves to come back to power. Why not? 
but let's do it as we do it with soccer. A team will win the championship this year, all the other teams are, you see, next year we're going to get it. But this year you won, you are in power. You, I will not try to seize power. So this is why I say real and renewed representativity in parliament. And dignity is education, but relevant education. Dignity has an economic side, which is growth, job creation, and wealth creation. If you don't make enough money to have your family live decently, one-fourth of the Tunisians live under, with under two dollars a day. In a country where many people are extremely rich on the uh, seashores. And we have the possibility of growing at five plus five. Turkey is growing at 11 percent. I was in uh, Côte d'Ivoire with President Ouattara two weeks ago. We were congratulating him for the success of the democratic transition. He was telling us this year Côte d'Ivoire is going to grow at eight and a half percent. So I'm not talking theoretical figures. We need to do that. Where are we at in Tunis? Are we achieving that? No. The uh, rating agencies have confirmed the bad rating of Tunisia that was downrated last year to B, B, B minus with negative outlook. For those who are not specialists in finance, this is the lowest rating that is considered to be investment grade. If we go down one more notch, we become uh, uh, a speculative grade. So this rating is a positive news politically. They said, okay, politically Tunisia is advancing. Therefore, we did not downgrade it even more. But it is negative news because it didn't go up. And this is because Tunisia, in spite of a good start from the economic growth, with the first month of 2012, the government led by another has proven incompetent in getting the economy off the ground. Minus 1.8% growth the first month of 2012. I'm in the opposite position. Of course, it's my best interest that they flunk it, but it's not my best interest as a citizen, because those who suffer are the poor people. And the poor people, I don't want them to suffer more. So when the government asks, me, asks us, please come help, I do. And when they elected me to be vice president of the finance committee, it's because they wanted to share uh, opinions with people who don't belong to their majority. S this says a message uh, not so much to America, but to Europe. Europe used to sell the idea for 20 years that North Africa needs stability, because if there is stability in North Africa, we have less immigrants, less illegal, illegal immigrants to Europe. We are telling Europe this is wrong. Mr. Sarkozy said that in Tunisia, the choice is between dictatorship and the Taliban's. He completely ignored the masses of pro-democracy people in the middle. And because of that, he has supported the <laughs> dictatorship much more than was necessary. So here, I try to defend the idea that the only way to guarantee stability is through high growth and high wealth creation. Einstein has said, what is the only way to be on a bicycle and not having your feet on the ground and not falling. The only way is to advance the bicycle, is to move up, otherwise you'll fall. So emergency is quite necessary and this is why I think here that the uh, Arab Spring is reaching a third stage of Arab countries. I'm using the writings of a very important philosopher from uh, the Antilles, uh, his name is Franz Fanon, those of you maybe have read it. He wrote only two books and died very young of leukemia. I was a kid and he used to come to Tunis supporting the Algerian revolution. And his first book is called The Wretched of the Earth. His book he wrote against colonialism. What is colonialism? It's one way of sucking rent from the people in favor of the powerful. So he said, this cannot last forever, and colonialism has to be fought. 
which was successfully fought. But he wrote another book, which is called Black Skin, White Masks, Talking to Africans. Watch out. Once the colonialism falls, you will govern your country, but don't behave as if you were in, in apparently Africans, black skin. But inside of you, you have white masks. You're working for the best interests of the former colonial power. And this is what happened in the Arab world during these past years. The creation of wealth and the policies were made not for the interests of the people of the country, but for the interests of the patrons who were patronizing those who were in power. Today, the Arab Spring is offering the international community from the States, from Europe, or from the BRICS, the possibility of a win-win solution. If a country grows at 8%, any investment there has stands very good chances to be profitable. And those who invest will make money together with the country. So this is why today we are contemplating a strategy in the area that would create this condition. I will give it to you in a moment, but if we don't go towards emergence, what's going to happen? What's going to happen is that the opportunities will be missed from one to three generations in the year. The cost will be very high. It will be what is called in, by economists and physicists a hysteresis curve. That means we will not go down the same road uh, uh, we took to go up. We're going to go down worse. The Middle East and North Africa the, and Sub-Saharan Africa will be the most touch, uh, badly touched by this. And this would put this area again under domination. That means economic, military, and political. Will this be good for Europe? In appearance. Because in reality, frustrations would grow and this would lead to more violent convulsions and revolutions. Now, Emergence would lead to strong growth, enough job creation, battle, balance of payment uh, equilibrium, investment, investment in infrastructure, roads, railways, ADSL, education, technology, and health, and access to resources. If it's not emergence, it's submersion, going underwater, keeping the barriers between the countries, having poor governance and corruption, poor technology included in the foreign direct investment, very poor projects in the area, and inadequate human resource development. If we look at the way to finance the area, that could be uh, a possibility, but we know that that is extremely dangerous. Look at what is happening to very rich countries with that. Are there alternative ways to finance it? Yes. One way is to mobilize resources from the area in the area. Here we have three uh, years, 2007, 8, and 9, where we see where the funds of the uh, sovereign wealth funds of the uh, Middle East have been going. We see that sovereign wealth funds uh, have been uh, going more and more to MENA region that you see here in red. MENA region, even during years when sovereign wealth funds were not investing a lot. They were looking for real investment opportunities. Why is it so? What happened in 2008 in the United States? Subprime crisis. During the subprime crisis, Gulf investors lost $2.5 trillion in Wall Street. $2,500 billion were lost. So now they are trying to look for real investment. And this is one source we should be using. I have used this in Tunis when my government asked me, you are teaching finance, can you practice it? I said, no, I can't. But Bourguiba decided that I should start a bank for the Tunisian government, an investment bank, and attract money from Bahrain in the form of investment certificates to clean up the lake of Tunis, which is about 3,000 hectares, and prepare land, which is one-third the city of Tunis, without any debt to the government. And I did that just selling certificates in Bahrain to those who believed that the business plan that was offered to them was credible. 
The project costs about $30 billion. Tunis has one third of its surface that is added. Investors are getting dividends and the Tunisian government has put only the land in the project. No debt. So I'm saying this to say if we have a structure of the financing that is appropriate, we can attract the financing here. But what I'm more interested in is this. If we look at the southern Mediterranean rim uh, in 2010, it is in blue. If you compare it to the 12 criteria that we are having here, infrastructure, macroeconomic stability, health and primary education, it's dominated everywhere by the northern Mediterranean, I mean European countries and Turkey, except for two levels, macroeconomic stability, because IMF has introduced what, uh, what was called structural adjustment programs, and market uh, size, because the population in the southern Mediterranean is much higher. Now, how can we change that? With Davos team I'm working with, we examined three possibilities. One possibility that says we will keep on taking resources and selling them uh, outside. You see then the blue advantages will even shrink more by 2030. We will be giving to our children in an even lesser perspective for the future. Second possibility if we introduce industrialization that's linked to firms that do not pertain to the area, they will send some companies that fabricate in where we are, but still southern Mediterranean will be dominated, except for the market again. The possibility that we examined is called Mediterra Africa. The idea is to make the Sahara Desert as a creative link between Northern Africa, Middle East, and Sub-Saharan Africa. And with projects like Desert Tech by Germany, that it is going to cover all the Sahara from Mauritania, Senegal, until Saudi, going through Algeria, Libya, Egypt, etc. Enough electricity will be produced in the daytime to have a, an industries like aluminium, which needs lots of electricity, and agro-industrial activities in the, uh, in the uh, northern part of the savanna in sub-Saharan Africa that looks very much like Texas. There could be enough meat production to cover all Africa. So this is a bet there that the Arab Spring countries should take into consideration not to close themselves on themselves, to open themselves on their neighbors, not only Arab but African, and propose alternatives to investors, mainly from the Gulf, that would be seeking real growth and not virtual growth through subprimes. I will stop at this stage, uh, hoping that I have convinced you that we have to keep on going in this direction, and I will take your questions. Thank you very much. How much time do we have left for questions? We have half an hour? We have about 10 minutes because he has a front 45. Oh, okay. So we have 10 minutes for uh, questions. So I, I, I will ask, uh, I will Sorry. use my position to next to you and ask just two Please very quick, quick questions. So it seems that, uh, I, I think I'm very sympathetic with you that the secret of success for democracy in this part of the world is going to be the economy. If the economies are healthy, then uh, democracy's chance of surviving is high. So two, two questions. The first is, you noted that um, Anahda is doing a bad job economically. Could you name for us sort of the biggest mistake that you think they've made, the biggest avoidable mistake that you think they've uh, made in this kind of interim period? Or is, are we just in a period where no matter who is in charge, 
uh, they, they are facing a very difficult situation that uh, it's hard to get right. The second uh, question I wanted to ask was um, the kind of investment strategy that you described. You need to, uh, as you know, uh, it, it attract investment from other places, and you uh, placed a lot of emphasis on investment coming from the Arab world, and particularly uh, the Gulf states. And my question is, are these Gulf states uh, invested in the uh, survival and thriving of democracy in this part of the world, or in fact, should we expect them not to? Good question. Good question. <laughs> and let me start with the last one. Their investment would not be supporting democracy. Actually, we're not convinced they will be supporting democracy. Uh, I think that the Saudi regime, I respect very much Saudi people, Saudi regime is very much anti-democracy. Mr. Ben Ali is in Saudi Arabia. And uh, the Wahhabist view uh, of Islam and of uh, ruling the country has to change. Young Saudis are changing. Ladies in Saudi Arabia are protesting the fact that they are not allowed the right to drive a car. Uh, their husbands are supporting them. Saudi has got to change, but maybe not as fast as us. Their money is something else. Their money, they want to invest where they take less risks. It's only risk management. But again, you're right to mention this. Uh, I'm not implying that money should come only from the Gulf. I think the m most important origin of money should be local. There are resources locally, but they are misused because people don't have confidence in the system. When Turkey, with Erdogan, who was the mayor of the city of Istanbul at the time, needed a second bridge on the Bosphorus between Asia and Europe, uh, Erdogan invited many bankers around the Mediterranean. I was there. And he said, OK, why uh, can you help us raise enough money to build the second bridge? What we did with some other investment banks, we told him, you don't need the money. You have it here. We structured the deal that, so that a company of the bridge, not ownership of the bridge, we don't care about ownership, that, that's the Turkish government, Turkish flag on it, but the management of the bridge is a special purpose vehicle. And we sold parts of this uh, special purpose vehicle. On the stock market of Turkey, it was sold in 48 hours. And citizens and firms bought it. Why? Because they saw their dividends crossing, the trucks and the cars crossing 24 hours. And Turkey could finance by itself what has been refused by the World Bank and by the international markets. So I say, we have our uh, resources here, there. And this brings me to the first question. The first mistake of ANATA is that they still don't understand the importance of security. Investors uh, in Tunisia, foreign investors have increased their investments because they are kind of positive ghettos there. They are protected. But Tunisians have decreased their investments by 15% because Enada uh, is a bit, uh, uh, I mean, doesn't want to implement the law. Somebody breaks the law in the factory, etc. Enada doesn't intervene. They're scared. Come on. They do not know how to practice power. They know how to practice resistance, opposition, but they are not acting as if they were behind the steering wheel. This is the first example. Second example is the uh, budget for 2012. They proposed the budget. It's way below the needs of the young Tunisian ladies and gentlemen who need jobs. Uh, I was talking with Professor Rogoff this morning, the specialist on debt. And he told me with the level of debt of Tunisia, which is about 40% of GDP, we are far away from the 100% of GDP in the United States. He said they wouldn't encourage debt, but in this type of situation, you do have to get more debt in order to get things off the ground. And now that doesn't know anything about this. They're ideologists. So uh, we try to explain to them that's so weird. We explain to our opponents what they should do because it's the best interests of the country. These are two simple examples. Yes? Open it up for questions. Okay. I'm oh, sorry. No, 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 please. Yes. <laughs> uh, you had your hand up first. Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, you're essentially restructuring your economy from the ground up with the powers that you have, both in creating a new constitution and, and the legislative powers as well. So I was wondering if you could expand on the governance issue and how that, um, you know, could bring about three percentage points more growth every year. What kind of economic freedoms would you like to see a trend in the Constitution? And then from your legislative perspective, what policies would your party be pushing for? 
very good question, thank you. <coughs> In a nutshell, we have, uh, Tunisia is 10, 10 million people, 820 million, uh, 820,000 unemployed by the month of June. Okay, that's very high. The unemployed among the degree, high degree holder, higher degree holder are more than 25%, one out of four has never worked. So the idea is to uh, 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 firstly not allow corruption to block the creation of a firm. It's not the administration that is going to absorb 820,000 people. It's not the government-owned firms. They tried to hire as many people as they could. Actually, the phosphate company almost went down because it hired too many people during the revolution. The real way to grow is to promote private sector. I don't call it private sector. I call it patriotic sector. They are not enemies. Uh, some Marxists say private sector is the enemy of the state. No, they are patriots. Even foreigners who invest in Tunisia are patriots. So, we should create a business-friendly environment. We should have rules. If you play soccer in the quarter of Tunis or Cairo without a referee, most of the times the game ends in a boxing game because this is a goal, this is not a goal. So we need to have rules that are very precise. And now we are working on simple laws to make the rules clear. Three, we should get the monies that those thieves took out. I don't think it is uh, important uh, to get uh, all that money because of the money, but because of the signal that will show for future uh, 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 people who would try to steal. So cleaning up the whole system is also part of our job, and there are special commissions who are taking care of these things from a legal point of view. Uh, we don't want to put people in jail. We want people never to do this again. And what President Mandela did, did in uh, South Africa, we, uh, uh, we want to do too. We want people to be judged in order for them to admit what they did was wrong, to say it very clearly so that society knows it is wrong, and then we don't care if they go to jail or not. We don't want society to go in that direction. So business-friendly environment, clean environment, and uh, separating between the government and the private sector is important. Ibn Khaldun has written long time ago that if the prince practices commerce, it's bad for the prince and it's bad for commerce. Ashley. So uh, you focused a lot in your presentation on the economic side of transition, but I'm just thinking about the political transition from, I guess, what started as an opposition movement to now kind of trying to transition into a regime type. Um, and what is the role of kind of of the nature of interaction between political parties and kind of civil society at this stage of the Arab Spring transition, because it seems as though in the first stage, the, the Arab street and civil society was the most prominent, and there needs to be some connection for the transition to be smooth. So are there efforts to connect, um, and what is the nature of that connection? Yeah, this is a, also a very important uh, uh, question, because before the elections, the only way to express your opinion was to have a sit-in in the place of the government. And they kicked out two governments this way, that way. <coughs> but that's not a way to govern. The Tunisian people came back to the idea that they have to have representatives of the people. If they are good, they keep them. If they are bad, they kick them out in the next election. But their duty is to control government. We uh, invite the Minister of Interior, the Minister of so-and-so, and we ask him questions the governor of Central Bank. So this is the way it is run in a uh, uh, modern way. Now, civil society is not only parties. Civil societies are regroupments. And these regroupments today, are uh, they have their place within the commissions that we have, not official, because the, uh, only elected people can come in there. But when we organize hearings, we always invite civil society representatives to come. For instance, ladies' organizations when we are dealing with employment, because we don't want employment to be segregated. Uh, we are a temporary assembly. We are trying to do as best as we can. We have demonstrations every day 
against us around the parliament and I'm happy that they are there because if we do not do our work correctly, they say it very bluntly. Yes, sir. So I have two questions. Uh, first, you talked briefly about other ways of financing rather than debt. In Tunisia, how do you see the role of private equity and how should uh, the government, what should the government do in order to attract these private equity funds? Second question, which strategy would help North Africa to even more integrate economically with sub-Saharan Africa? Well, it will be the last question. Oh. But there were two interesting they, questions. You, your handlers are telling us that you have <laughs> yeah, to okay, okay. okay. So uh, we have uh, one hour for to answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> no. PEs are necessary. It's a second stage. Uh, today, what is needed is to create firms, to encourage firms to be created. Not necessarily ex nihilo. If I were in government, my program would be to uh, invest in infrastructure uh, in the north West, the center, west, and south. Yes? yes uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I could just ask one question at the end, in very brief. This is the boss. That's boss. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so, invest in uh, grand travaux, in large uh, wor works for as infrastructure, and then create jobs for those who can work already on them. Okay? But instead of creating jobs, they can create firms and sell their service to these companies. Those firms will be green fields. It's not PE. PE needs to work with companies that exist already. So once we started these green fields, and some of them, and a large number of them, I hope, survives, then PE will come into the picture. PE exists now, but it doesn't have enough opportunities. That's weird. So there is more money in PEs than opportunities to finance. So this has to be done. Uh, new financing has to be done according to what is called participatory finance. Uh, some people call it Islamic finance. It is Islamic, it is Jewish, it is Christian. Actually, it is Abrahamic finance. Uh, instead of, really, instead of having, uh, prof uh, having an interest that is fixed ahead of time, you have a profit and loss sharing. So states, instead of financing themselves by selling bonds on the market, they can sell sukuk. What is a sak or sukuk? You have five projects that you put in a special purpose vehicle that you sell as a sold with the project in Bahrain. And those who are going to buy the sak know that they will earn a percentage of the profit that is going to be derived from this uh, idea. So the sukuk France has voted laws to make it legal. Tunisia still doesn't have any laws for that. So we have to do our homework. Uh, Africa is fundamental. Uh, I was in Benin a month ago, and it was a weekend, so I stayed in the hotel. And I heard some people speaking Arabic with Tunisian accent. I looked around and I found a bunch of Tunisian young people. I thought it was a soccer team. I told them, what are you doing here, soccer games? I mean, no, no. Uh, we read on the internet that there was a road to be reconstructed and there was a competitive uh, bidding there. We answered from our small company in Tunisia, not even in Tunis, and we won the thing. So we came here, this is the first time we leave Tunis. I think we have a lot to do together. We used to ignore each other. I started the uh, HSA executive clubs in Dakar, in uh, Abidjan, in Cotonou, in uh, Lomé, in Douala, and I see that many <coughs> Moroccans are investing in Africa. Bank of Africa, the largest shares are Moroccan. So here I say we do have to work together. Well, I, think, I think we're going to have to end it there. And join me in thanking Dr. Oh my God.